Section 7 of Chapter 22 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. T. Macduff. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 22, Section 7. The papers written by Monmouth were delivered by Lady Mary to her husband. If the advice which they contained had been followed, there can be little doubt that the object of the adviser would have been attained. The king would have been bitterly mortified. There would have been a general panic among public men of every party. Even Marlborough's serene fortitude would have been severely tried, and Shrewsbury would probably have shot himself. But that Fenwick would have put himself in a better situation is by no means clear. Such was his own opinion. He saw that the step which he was urged to take was hazardous. He knew that he was urged to take that step not because it was likely to save himself, but because it was certain to annoy others. And he was resolved not to be Monmouth's tool. On the 1st of December the bill went through the earliest stage without a division. Then Fenwick's confession, which had, by the royal command, been laid on the table, was read. And then Marlborough stood up. "'Nobody can wonder,' he said, "'that a man whose head is in danger should try to save himself by accusing others.' I assure your lordships that, since the accession of his present majesty, I have had no intercourse with Sir John on any subject whatever, and this I declare on my word of honour. Marlborough's assertion may have been true, but it was perfectly compatible with the truth of all that Fenwick had said. Godolphin went further. I certainly did, he said, continue to the last, in the service of King James and of his queen. I was esteemed by them both. But I cannot think that a crime— it is possible that they and those who are about them may imagine that I am still attached to their interest. That I cannot help. But it is utterly false that I have had any such dealings with the court of Saint-Germain as are described in the paper which your lordships have read. Fenwick was then brought in, and asked whether he had any further confession to make. Several peers interrogated him, but to no purpose. Monmouth, who could not believe that the papers which he had sent to Newgate had produced no effect, put in a friendly and encouraging manner several questions intended to bring out answers which would have been by no means agreeable to the accused lords no such answer however was to be extracted from fenwick mamma saw that his ingenious machinations had failed enraged and disappointed he suddenly turned round and became more zealous for the bill than any other peer in the house Everybody noticed the rapid change in his temper and manner, but that change was at first imputed merely to his well-known levity. On the 8th of December the bill was again taken into consideration, and on that day Fenwick, accompanied by his counsel, was in attendance. But before he was called in, a previous question was raised. Several distinguished Tories, particularly Nottingham, Rochester, Norman B. and Leeds, said that, in their opinion, it was idle to inquire whether the prisoner was guilty or not guilty, unless the House was of opinion that he was a person so formidable that, if guilty, he ought to be attainted by an act of Parliament. They did not wish, they said, to hear any evidence. For even on the supposition that the evidence left no doubt of his criminality, they should still think it better to leave him unpunished than to make a law for punishing him. The general sense, however, was decidedly for proceeding. The prisoner and his counsellor were allowed another week to prepare themselves, and at length, on the 15th of December, the struggle commenced in earnest. The debates were the longest and the hottest, the divisions were the largest, the protests were the most numerously signed that had ever been known in the whole history of the House of Peers. Repeatedly, the benches continued to be filled from ten in the morning till past midnight. The health of many lords suffered severely, for the winter was bitterly cold but the majority was not disposed to be indulgent. One evening Devonshire was unwell. He stole away and went to bed, but Black Rod was soon sent to bring him back. Leeds, whose constitution was extremely infirm, complained loudly. It is very well, he said, for young gentlemen to sit down to their suppers and their wine at two o'clock in the morning, but some of us old men are likely to be of as much use here as they, and we shall soon be in our graves if we are forced to keep such hours at such a season." So strongly was party spirit excited that this appeal was disregarded, and the House continued to sit fourteen or fifteen hours a day. The chief opponents of the bill were Rochester, 
Nottingham, Normanby, and Leeds. The chief orators on the other side were Tankerville, who, in spite of the deep stains which a life singularly unfortunate had left on his public and private character, always spoke with an eloquence which riveted the attention of his hearers. Burnett, who made a great display of historical learning, Wharton, whose lively and familiar style of speaking acquired in the House of Commons, sometimes shocked the formality of the Lords, and Monmouth, who had always carried the liberty of debate to the verge of licentiousness, and who now never opened his lips without inflicting a wound on the feelings of some adversary. A very few nobles of great weight, Devonshire, Dorset, Pembroke, and Ormond, formed a third party. They were willing to use the bill of attainder as an instrument of torture for the purpose of wringing a full confession out of the prisoner. But they were determined not to give a final vote for sending him to the scaffold. The first division was on the question whether secondary evidence of what Goodman could have proved should be admitted. On this occasion Burnett closed the debate by a powerful speech which none of the Tory orators could undertake to answer without premeditation. A hundred and twenty-six lords were present, a number unprecedented in our history. There were seventy-three contents and fifty-three non-contents. Thirty-six of the minority protested against the decision of the House. The next great trial of strength was on the question whether the bill should be read a second time. The debate was diversified by a curious episode. Monmouth, in a vehement declamation, threw some severe and well-merited reflections on the memory of the late Lord Jeffreys. The title and part of the ill-gotten wealth of Jeffreys had descended to his son, a dissolute lad who had lately come of age, and who was then sitting in the house. The young man fired at hearing his father reviled. The house was forced to interfere, and to make both the disputants promise that the matter should go no further. On this day a hundred and twenty-eight peers were present. The second reading was carried by seventy-three to fifty-five, and forty-nine of the fifty-five protested. It was now thought by many that Fenwick's courage would give way. It was known that he was very unwilling to die. Hitherto he might have flattered himself with hopes that the bill would miscarry. But now that it had passed one house and seemed certain to pass the other, it was probable that he would save himself by disclosing all that he knew. He was again put to the bar and interrogated. He refused to answer on the ground that his answers might be used against him by the Crown at the Old Bailey. He was assured that the House would protect him, but he pretended that this assurance was not sufficient. The House was not always sitting. He might be brought to trial during a recess and hanged before their lordships met again. The royal word alone, he said, would be a complete guarantee. The peers ordered him to be removed and immediately resolved that Wharton should go to Kensington and should entreat His Majesty to give the pledge which the prisoner required. Wharton hastened to Kensington and hastened back with a gracious answer. Fenwick was again placed at the bar. The royal word, he was told, had been passed, that nothing which he might say there should be used against him in any other place. Still he made difficulties. He might confess all that he knew, and yet might be told that he was still keeping something back. In short, he would say nothing till he had a pardon. He was then, for the last time, solemnly cautioned from the woolsack. He was assured that if he would deal ingenuously with the lords, they would be intercessors for him at the foot of the throne, and that their intercession would not be unsuccessful. If he continued obstinate, they would proceed with the bill. A short interval was allowed him for consideration, and he was then required to give his final answer. I have given it, he said. I have no security. If I had, I should be glad to satisfy the house. He was then carried back to his cell, and the peers separated, having sat far into the night. At noon they met again. The third reading was moved. Tennyson spoke for the bill with more ability than was expected from him, and Monmouth with as much sharpness as in the previous debates. But Devonshire declared that he could go no further. He had hoped that fear would induce Fenwick to make a frank confession. That hope was at an end. The question now was simply whether this man should be put to death by an act of Parliament, and to that question Devonshire said that he must answer, not content. It is not easy to understand on what principle he can have thought himself justified in threatening to do what he did not think himself justified in doing. He was, however, followed by Dorset, Ormond, Pembroke, and two or three others. Devonshire in the name of his little party, and Rochester in the name of the Tories, 
offered to waive all objections to the mode of proceeding, if the penalty were reduced from death to perpetual imprisonment. But the majority, though weakened by the defection of some considerable men, was still a majority, and would hear of no terms of compromise. The third reading was carried by only sixty-eight votes to sixty-one. Fifty-three lords recorded their dissent, and forty-one subscribed a protest in which the arguments against the bill were ably summed up. The peers whom Fenwick had accused took different sides. Marlborough steadily voted with the majority, and induced Prince George to do the same. Godolphin as steadily voted with the minority, but, with characteristic wariness, abstained from giving any reasons for his votes. No part of his life warrants us in ascribing his conduct to any exalted motive. It's probable that, having been driven from office by the Whigs, and forced to take refuge among the Tories, he thought it advisable to go with his party. As soon as the bill had been read a third time, the attention of the peers was called to a matter which deeply concerned the honor of their order. Lady Mary Fenwick had been not unnaturally moved to the highest resentment by the conduct of Monmouth. He had, after professing a great desire to save her husband, suddenly turned around and become the most merciless of her husband's persecutors, and all this solely because the unfortunate prisoner would not suffer himself to be used as an instrument for the accomplishing of a wild scheme of mischief. She might be excused for thinking that revenge would be sweet. In her rage, she showed to her kinsman, the Earl of Carlisle, the papers which she had received from the Duchess of Norfolk. Carlisle brought the subject before the lords. The papers were produced. Lady Mary declared that she had received them from the Duchess. The Duchess declared that she had received them from Monmouth. Elizabeth Lawson confirmed the evidence of her two friends. All the bitter things which the petulant Earl had said about William were repeated. The rage of both the great factions broke forth with ungovernable violence. The Whigs were exasperated by discovering that Monmouth had been secretly laboring to bring to shame and ruin two eminent men with whose reputation the reputation of the whole party was bound up. The Tories accused him of dealing treacherously and cruelly by the prisoner and the prisoner's wife. Both among the Whigs and among the Tories, Monmouth had, by his sneers and invectives, made numerous personal enemies, whom fear of his wit and of his sword had hitherto kept in awe. All these enemies were now open-mouthed against him. There was great curiosity to know what he would be able to say in his defense. His eloquence, the correspondent of the States General wrote, had often annoyed others. He would now want it all to protect himself. That eloquence, indeed, was of a kind much better suited to attack than to defense. Monmouth spoke near three hours in a confused and rambling manner, boasted extravagantly of his services and sacrifices, told the House that he had borne a great part in the Revolution, that he had made four voyages to Holland in the evil times, that he had since refused great places, that he had always held lucre in contempt. I, he said, turning significantly to Nottingham, have bought no great estate. I have built no palaces. I am twenty thousand pounds poorer than when I entered public life. My old hereditary mansion is ready to fall about my ears. Who that remembers what I have done and suffered for His Majesty will believe that I speak disrespectfully of him. He solemnly declared, and this was the most serious of the many serious faults of his long and unquiet life, that he had nothing to do with the papers which had caused so much scandal. The papists, he said, hated him. They had laid a scheme to ruin him. His ungrateful kinswoman had consented to be their implement, and had requited the strenuous efforts which he had made in defense of her honor by trying to blast his. When he concluded there was a long silence. He asked whether their lordships wished him to withdraw. Then Leeds, to whom he had once professed a strong attachment, but whom he had deserted with characteristic inconstancy, and assailed with characteristic petulance, seized the opportunity of revenging himself. It is quite unnecessary, the shrewd old statesman said, that the noble earl should withdraw at present. The question which we have now to decide is merely whether these papers do or do not deserve our censure. Who wrote them is a question which may be considered hereafter. It was then moved and unanimously resolved that the papers were scandalous, and that the author had been guilty of a high crime and misdemeanor. 
Monmouth himself was, by these dexterous tactics, forced to join in condemning his own compositions. Then the House proceeded to consider the charge against him. The character of his cousin, the Duchess, did not stand high, but her testimony was confirmed both by direct and by circumstantial evidence. Her husband said with sour pleasantry that he gave entire faith to what she had deposed. My Lord Monmouth thought her good enough to be wife to me, and if she's good enough to be wife to me, I am sure that she is good enough to be witness against him. In a house of near eighty peers, only eight or ten seemed inclined to show any favor to Monmouth. He was pronounced guilty of the act of which he had, in the most solemn manner, protested that he was innocent. He was sent to the tower, he was turned out of all his places, and his name was struck out of the council book. It might well have been thought that the ruin of his fame and of his fortunes was irreparable, but there was about his nature an elasticity which nothing could subdue. In his prison, indeed, he was as violent as a falcon just caged, and would, if he had been long detained, have died of mere impatience. His only solace was to contrive wild and romantic schemes for extricating himself from his difficulties and avenging himself on his enemies. When he regained his liberty, he stood alone in the world. A dishonored man, more hated by the Whigs than any Tory, and by the Tories than any Whig, and reduced to such poverty that he talked of retiring to the country, living like a farmer, and putting his countess into the dairy to churn and to make cheeses. Yet even after this fall, that mounting spirit rose again, and rose higher than ever. When next he appeared before the world, he had inherited the earldom of the head of his family. He had ceased to be called by the tarnished name of Monmouth, and he soon added new luster to the name of Peterborough. He was still all air and fire. His ready wit and his dauntless courage made him formidable. Some amiable qualities, which contrasted strangely with his vices, and some great exploits, of which the effect was heightened by the careless levity with which they were performed, made him popular and his countrymen were willing to forget that a hero of whose achievements they were proud, and who was not more distinguished by parts and valor than by courtesy and generosity, had stooped to tricks worthy of the pillory. End of Section 7 Recording by S. T. Macduff of chapter 22 of a history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by s t macduff history of england by thomas babington macaulay chapter 22 section 8 it is interesting and instructive to compare the fate of shrewsbury with the fate of peterborough the honor of Shrewsbury was safe. He had been triumphantly acquitted of the charges contained in Fenwick's confession. He was soon afterwards still more triumphantly acquitted of a still more odious charge. A wretched spy named Matthew Smith, who thought that he had not been sufficiently rewarded and was bent on being revenged, affirmed that Shrewsbury had received early information of the assassination plot, but had suppressed that information and had taken no measures to prevent the conspirators from accomplishing their design. That this was a foul calumny no person who has examined the evidence can doubt. The king declared that he could himself prove his minister's innocence, and the peers, after examining Smith, pronounced the accusation unfounded. Shrewsbury was cleared as far as it was in the power of the crown and of the parliament to clear him. He had power and wealth, the favor of the king, and the favor of the people. No man had a greater number of devoted friends. He was the idol of the Whigs, yet he was not personally disliked by the Tories. It should seem that his situation was one which Peterborough might well have envied. But happiness and misery are from within. Peterborough had one of those minds of which the deepest wounds heal and leave no scar. Shrewsbury had one of those minds in which the slightest scratch may fester to the death. He had been publicly accused of corresponding with Saint-Germain, and though King, Lords, and Commons had pronounced him innocent, his conscience told him that he was guilty. The praises which he knew that he had not deserved sounded to him like reproaches. 
he never regained his lost peace of mind. He left office, but one cruel recollection accompanied him into retirement. He left England, but one cruel recollection pursued him over the Alps and the Apennines. On a memorable day, indeed big with the fate of his country, he again, after many inactive and inglorious years, stood forth the Shrewsbury of 1688. Scarcely anything in history is more melancholy than that late and solitary gleam, lighting up the close of a life which had dawned so splendidly, and which had so early become hopelessly troubled and gloomy. On the day on which the Lords passed the Bill of Attainder, they adjourned over the Christmas holidays. The fate of Fenwick, consequently, remained during more than a fortnight in suspense. In the interval, plans of escape were formed, and it was thought necessary to place a strong military guard around Newgate. Some Jacobites knew William so little as to send him anonymous letters threatening that he should be shot or stabbed if he dared to touch a hair of the prisoner's head. On the morning of the 11th of January, he passed the bill. He at the same time passed a bill which authorized the government to detain Bernardi and some other conspirators in custody during twelve months. On the evening of that day, a deeply mournful event was the talk of all London. The Countess of Aylesbury had watched with intense anxiety the proceedings against Sir John. Her lord had been as deep as Sir John in treason, was like Sir John in confinement, and had, like Sir John, been a party to Goodman's flight. She had learned, with dismay, that there was a method by which a criminal who was beyond the reach of the ordinary law might be punished. Her terror had increased at every stage in the progress of the Bill of Attainder. On the day in which the royal assent was to be given, her agitation became greater than her frame could support. When she heard the sound of the guns which announced that the king was on his way to Westminster, she fell into fits and died in a few hours. Even after the bill had become law, strenuous efforts were made to save Fenwick. His wife threw herself at William's feet and offered him a petition. He took the petition and said very gently that it should be considered, but that the matter was one of public concern and that he must deliberate with his ministers before he decided. She then addressed herself to the lords. She told them that her husband had not expected his doom, that he had not had time to prepare himself for death, that he had not, during his long imprisonment, seen a divine. They were easily induced to request that he might be respited for a week. A respite was granted. But forty-eight hours before it expired, Lady Mary presented to the lords another petition, imploring them to intercede with the king that her husband's punishment might be commuted to banishment. The house was taken by surprise, and a motion to adjourn was with difficulty carried by two votes. On the morrow, the last day of Fenwick's life, a similar petition was presented to the commons. But the Whig leaders were on their guard. The attendance was full, and a motion for reading the orders of the day was carried by a hundred and fifty-two to a hundred and seven. In truth, neither branch of the legislature could, without condemning itself, request William to spare Fenwick's life. Jurymen, who have in the discharge of a painful duty pronounced a culprit guilty, may, with perfect consistency, recommend him to the favorable consideration of the Crown. But the Houses ought not to have passed the Bill of Attainder unless they were convinced not merely that Sir John had committed high treason, but also that he could not, without serious danger to the Commonwealth, be suffered to live. He could not be at once a proper object of such a bill and a proper object of the royal mercy. On the 28th of January, the execution took place. In compliment to the noble families with which Fenwick was connected, orders were given that the ceremonial should be in all respects the same as when a peer of the realm suffers death. A scaffold was erected on Tower Hill and hung with black. The prisoner was brought from Newgate in the coach of his kinsman, the Earl of Carlisle, which was surrounded by a troop of the life guards. Though the day was cold and stormy, the crowd of spectators was immense. But there was no disturbance, and no sign that the multitude sympathized with the criminal. He behaved with a firmness which had not been expected from him. He ascended the scaffold with steady steps, and bowed courteously to the persons who were assembled on it, but spoke to none except White the deprived bishop of Peterborough. 
White prayed with him during about a half an hour. In the prayer, the king was commended to the divine protection, but no name which could give offense was pronounced. Fenwick then delivered a sealed paper to the sheriffs, took leave of the bishop, knelt down, laid his head on the block, and exclaimed, Lord Jesus, receive my soul. His head was severed from his body at a single blow. His remains were placed in a rich coffin and buried that night by torchlight under the pavement of St. Martin's Church. No person has since that day suffered death in England by act of attainder. Meanwhile, an important question about which public feeling was much excited had been under discussion. As soon as the Parliament met, a bill for regulating elections, differing little in substance from the bill which the King had refused to pass in the preceding session, was brought into the House of Commons, was eagerly welcomed by the country gentlemen, and was pushed through every stage. On the report, it was moved that five thousand pounds in personal estate should be a sufficient qualification for the representative of a city or borough. But this amendment was rejected. On the third reading, a rider was added, which permitted a merchant possessed of five thousand pounds to represent the town in which he resided. But it was provided that no person should be considered as a merchant because he was a proprietor of bank stock or East India stock. The fight was hard. Cowper distinguished himself among the opponents of the bill. His sarcastic remarks on the hunting, hawking boors, who wished to keep in their own hands the whole business of legislation, called forth some sharp rustic retorts. A plain squire, he was told, was as likely to serve the country well as the most fluent gownsman who was ready for a guinea to prove that black was white. On the question whether the bill should pass, the eyes were two hundred, the nose a hundred and sixty. The lords had twelve months before readily agreed to a similar bill, but they had since reconsidered the subject and changed their opinion. The truth is that if a law requiring every member of the House of Commons to possess an estate of some hundreds of pounds a year in land could have been strictly enforced, such a law would have been very advantageous to country gentlemen of moderate property, but it would have been by no means advantageous to the grandees of the realm. A lord of a small manor would have stood for the town in the neighborhood of which his family had resided during centuries without any apprehension that he should be opposed by some aldermen of London, whom the electors had never seen before the day of the nomination, and whose chief title to their favor was a pocket-book full of banknotes. But a great nobleman who had an estate of fifteen or twenty thousand pounds a year, and who commanded two or three boroughs, would no longer be able to put his younger son, his younger brother, his man of business into Parliament, or to earn a garter or a step in the peerage, by finding a seat for a lord of the treasury or an attorney general. On this occasion, therefore, the interest of the chiefs of the aristocracy, Norfolk and Somerset, Newcastle and Bedford, Pembroke and Dorset, coincided with that of the wealthy traders of the city and of the clever young aspirants of the temple, and was diametrically opposed to the interest of a squire of a thousand or twelve hundred a year. On the day fixed for the second reading, the attendance of lords was great. Several petitions from constituent bodies, which thought it hard that a new restriction should be imposed on the exercise of the elective franchise, were presented and read. After a debate of some hours, the bill was rejected by 62 votes to 37. Only three days later, a strong party in the Commons, burning with resentment, proposed to tack the bill which the peers had just rejected to the land tax bill. This motion would probably have been carried, had not Foley gone somewhat beyond the duties of his place, and under pretense of speaking to order, shown that such attack would be without a precedent in parliamentary history. When the question was put, the eyes raised so loud a cry that it was believed they were in the majority. But on a division, they proved to be only a hundred and thirty-five. The noes were a hundred and sixty-three. Other parliamentary proceedings of the session deserve mention. While the commons were busily engaged in the great work of restoring the finances, an incident took place which seemed, during a short time, likely to be fatal to the infant liberty of the press, but which eventually proved the means of confirming their liberty. Among the many newspapers which had been established since the expiration of the censorship was one called the Flying Post. The editor, John Salisbury, was the tool of a band of stock-jobbers in the city, 
whose interest it happened to be to cry down the public securities. He one day published a false and malicious paragraph, evidently intended to throw suspicion on the Exchequer Bills. On the credit of the Exchequer Bills depended, at that moment, the political greatness and the commercial prosperity of the realm. The House of Commons was in a flame. The Speaker issued his warrant against Salisbury. It was resolved without a division that a bill should be brought in to prohibit the publishing of news without a license. Forty-eight hours later the bill was presented and read. But the members had now had time to cool. There was scarcely one of them whose residence in the country had not, during the preceding summer, been made more agreeable by the London journals. Meager as those journals may seem to a person who has the Times daily on his breakfast table, they were to that generation a new and abundant source of pleasure. No Devonshire or Yorkshire gentleman, Whig or Tory, could bear the thought of being again dependent during seven months of every year for all information about what was doing in the world on news letters. If the bill passed, the sheets, which were now so impatiently expected twice a week at every country seat in the kingdom, would contain nothing but what it suited the Secretary of State to make public. They would be, in fact, so many London gazettes, and the most assiduous reader of the London Gazette might be utterly ignorant of the most important events of his time. A few voices, however, were raised in favor of a censorship. These papers, it was said, frequently contain mischievous matter. Then why are they not prosecuted, was the answer. Has the Attorney General filed an information against any one of them? And is it not absurd to ask us to give a new remedy by statute when the old remedy afforded by the common law has never been tried? On the question whether the bill should be read a second time, the eyes were only sixteen, the nose two hundred. Another bill, which fared better, ought to be noticed as an instance of the slow but steady progress of civilization. The ancient immunities enjoyed by some districts of the capital, of which the largest and the most infamous was Whitefriars, had produced abuses which could no longer be endured. The Templars on one side of Alsatia and the citizens on the other had long been calling on the government and the legislature to put down so monstrous a nuisance. Yet still bounded on the west by the great school of English jurisprudence and on the east by the great mart of English trade stood this labyrinth of squalid, tottering houses closely packed every one from cellar to cockloft with outcasts whose life was one long war with society. The best part of the population consisted of debtors who were in fear of bailiffs. The rest were attorneys struck off the roll, witnesses who carried straw in their shoes as a sign to inform the public where a false oath might be procured for half a crown, sharpers, receivers of stolen goods, clippers of coin, forgers of banknotes, and tawdry women, blooming with paint and brandy, who in their anger made free use of their nails and their scissors yet whose anger was less to be dreaded than their kindness. With these wretches the narrow alleys of the sanctuary swarmed. The rattling of dice, the call for more punch and more wine, and the noise of blasphemy and ribald song never ceased during the whole night. The benchers of the inner temple could bear the scandal and the annoyance no longer. They ordered the gate leading into Whitefriars to be bricked up. The Alsatians, mustered in great force, attacked the workmen, killed one of them, pulled down the wall, knocked down the sheriff who came to keep the peace, and carried off his gold chain, which, no doubt, was soon in the melting pot. The riot was not suppressed till a company of the foot guards arrived. This outrage excited general indignation. The city, indignant at the outrage offered to the sheriff, cried loudly for justice. Yet so difficult was it to execute any process in the dens of Whitefriars that near two years elapsed before a single ringleader was apprehended. The Savoy was another place of the same kind, smaller indeed and less renowned, but inhabited by a not less lawless population. An unfortunate tailor who ventured to go thither for the purpose of demanding payment of a debt was set upon by the whole mob of cheats, ruffians, and courtesans. He offered to give a full discharge to his debtor and a treat to the rabble, but in vain. He had violated their franchises, and this crime was not to be pardoned. He was knocked down, stripped, tarred, feathered. 
A rope was tied round his waist. He was dragged, naked, up and down the streets, amid yells of, A bailiff! A bailiff! Finally he was compelled to kneel down and to curse his father and mother. Having performed this ceremony, he was permitted, and the permission was blamed by many of the Savoyards, to limp home without a rag upon him. The Bog of Allen, the passes of the Grampians, were not more unsafe than this small knot of lanes, surrounded by the mansions of the greatest nobles of a flourishing and enlightened kingdom. At length, in 1697, a bill for abolishing the franchises of these places passed both houses and received the royal assent. The Alsatians and the Savoyards were furious. Anonymous letters containing menaces of assassination were received by members of Parliament who had made themselves conspicuous by the zeal with which they had supported the bill. But such threats only strengthened the general conviction that it was high time to destroy these nests of knaves and ruffians. A fortnight's grace was allowed, and it was made known that when that time had expired, the vermin who had been the curse of London would be unearthed and hunted without mercy. There was a tumultuous flight to Ireland, to France, to the colonies, to vaults and garrets in less notorious parts of the capital, and when, on the prescribed day, the sheriff's officers ventured to cross the boundary, they found those streets where, a few weeks before, the cry of a writ would have drawn together a thousand raging bullies and vixens as quiet as the cloister of a cathedral. End of section 8. Recording by S.T. Macduff. Section 9 of Chapter 22 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Raimundo. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 22, Section 9. On the 16th of April the king closed the session with a speech, in which he returned warm and well-merited thanks to the houses for the firmness and wisdom which had rescued the nation from commercial and financial difficulties unprecedented in our history. Before he set out for the continent, he conferred some new honors and made some new ministerial arrangements. Every member of the Whig junto was distinguished by some conspicuous mark of royal favor. Summers delivered up the seal, of which he was keeper. He received it back again with the higher title of Chancellor, and was immediately commanded to affix it to a patent, by which he was created Baron Summers of Eversham. Russell became Earl of Offord and Viscount Barfleur. No English title had ever before been taken from a place of battle lying within a foreign territory, but the precedent then set has been repeatedly followed, and the names of St. Vincent, Trafalgar, Camperdown, and Droro are now borne by the successors of great commanders. Russell seems to have accepted his earldom, after his fashion, not only without gratitude, but grumblingly, and as if some great wrong had been done him. What was a coronet to him? He had no child to inherit it. The only distinction which he should have prized was the garter, and the garter had been given to Portland. Of course, such things were for the Dutch, and it was strange presumption in an Englishman, though he might have won a victory which had saved the state, to expect that his pretensions would be considered till all the miniers about the palace had been served. Horton, still retaining his place of comptroller of the household, obtained the lucrative office of Chief Justice in Eyre, south of Trent, and his brother, Godwin Horton, was made a Lord of the Admiralty. Though the resignation of Godolphin had been accepted in October, no new commission of treasury was issued till after the prorogation. Who should be first commissioner was a question long and fiercely disputed, for Montague's faults had made him many enemies, and his merits many more. Dull formalists sneered at him as a wit and poet, who, no doubt, showed quick parts in debate, but who had already been raised far higher than his services merited, or than his brain would bear. It would be absurd to play such a young coxcomb, merely because he could talk fluently and cleverly, in an office on which the well-being of the kingdom depended. Surely Sir Stephen Fox was, of all the lords of the treasury, the fittest to be at the head of the board. He was an elderly man, grave, experienced, exact, laborious, and he had never made a verse in his life. The king hesitated during a considerable time between the two candidates, but time was all in Montague's favour, for from the first to the last day of the session his fame was constantly rising. The voice of the House of Commons and of the city loudly designated him as pre-eminently qualified to be the chief minister of finance. 
At length Sir Stephen Fox withdrew from the competition, though not with a very good grace. He wished it to be notified in the London Gazette that the place of First Lord had been offered to him, and declined by him. Such a notification would have been an affront to Montague, and Montague, flushed with prosperity and glory, was not in a mood to put up with affronts. The dispute was compromised. Montague became First Lord of the Treasury, and the vacant seat at the board was filled by Sir Thomas Littleton, one of the ablest and most consistent Whigs in the House of Commons. But, from tenderness to Fox, these promotions were not announced in the Gazette. Dorset resigned the office of Chamberlain, but not in ill humour, and retired loaded with marks of royal favour. He was succeeded by Sunderland, who was appointed one of the Lord's Justices, not without much murmuring from various quarters. To the Tories Sunderland was an object of unmixed detestation. Some of the Whig leaders had been unable to resist his insinuating address, and others were grateful for the services which he had lately rendered to the party. But the leaders could not restrain their followers. Plain men, who were zealous for civil liberty and for the Protestant religion, who were beyond the range of Sutherland's irresistible fascination, and who knew that he had state in the High Commission, concurred in the Declaration of Indulgence, borne witness against the seven bishops, and received the host from a popish priest, could not, without indignation and shame, see him standing, with the staff in his hand, close to the throne. Still more monstrous was it that such a man should be entrusted with the administration of the government during the absence of the sovereign. William did not understand these feelings. Sunderland was able, he was useful, he was unprincipled indeed, but so were all the English politicians of the generation which had learned, under the sullen tyranny of the saints, to disbelieve in virtue, and which had, during the wild jubilee of the Restoration, been utterly dissolved in vice. He was a fair specimen of his class, a little worse, perhaps, than Leeds or Godolphin, and about as bad as Russell or Marlborough. Why he was to be hunted from the herd the king could not imagine. Notwithstanding the discontent which was caused by Sunderland's elevation, England was, during the summer, perfectly quiet and in excellent temper. All but the fanatical Jacobites were elated by the rapid revival of trade and by the near prospect of peace. Nor were Ireland and Scotland less tranquil. In Ireland nothing deserving to be minutely related had taken place since Sidney had ceased to be Lord Lieutenant. The government had suffered the colonists to domineer unchecked over the native population, and the colonists had in turn been profoundly obsequious to the government. The proceedings of the local legislator which sate at Dublin had been in no respect more important or more interesting than the proceedings of the Assembly of Barbados. Perhaps the most momentous event in the parliamentary history of Ireland at this time was a dispute between the two houses which was caused by a collision between the coach of the Speaker and the coach of the Chancellor. There were indeed factions, but factions which sprang merely from personal pretensions and animosities. The names of Whig and Tory had been carried across St. George's Channel, but had in the passage lost all their meaning. A man who was called a Tory at Dublin would have passed at Westminster for as staunch a Whig as Horton. The highest churchmen in Ireland abhorred and dreaded Popery so much that they were disposed to consider every Protestant as a brother. They remembered the tyranny of James, the robberies, the burnings, the confiscations, the brass money, the act of attainder, with bitter resentment. They honoured William as their deliverer and preserver. Nay, they could not help feeling a certain respect even for the memory of Cromwell, for, whatever else he might have been, he had been the champion and the avenger of their race. Between the divisions of England, therefore, and the divisions of Ireland, there was scarcely anything in common. In England there were two parties, of the same race and religion, contending with each other. In Ireland there were two castes, of different races and religions, one trampling on the other. Scotland, too, was quiet. The harvest of the last year had indeed been scanty, and there was consequently much suffering. But the spirit of the nation was buoyed up by wild hopes, destined to end in cruel disappointment. A magnificent daydream of wealth and empire so completely occupied the minds of men that they hardly felt the present distress. How that dream originated, and by how terrible an awakening it was broken, will be related hereafter. In the autumn of 1696 the estates of Scotland met at Edinburgh. The attendance was thin, and the session lasted only five weeks. A supply amounting to little more than a hundred thousand pounds sterling was voted. Two acts for the securing of the government were passed. One of those acts required all persons in public trust to sign an association similar to the association which had been so generally subscribed in the south of the island. The other act provided that the Parliament of Scotland should not be dissolved by the death of the king. But by far the most important event of this short session was the passing of the act for the settling of schools.
by this memorable law it was in the scotch phrase statuted and ordained that every parish in the realm should provide a commodious schoolhouse and should pay a moderate stipend to a schoolmaster the effect could not be immediately felt but before one generation had passed away it began to be evident that the common people of scotland were superior in intelligence to the common people of any other country in europe to whatever land the scotchman might wander to whatever calling he might betake himself in america or in india in trade or in war the advantage which he derived from his early training raised him above his competitors if he was taken into a warehouse as a porter he soon became foreman if he enlisted in the army he soon became a sergeant scotland meanwhile in spite of the barrenness of her soil and the severity of her climate made such progress in agriculture in manufactures in commerce in letters in science in all that constitutes civilization as the old world has never seen equalled and as even the new world has scarcely seen surpassed this wonderful change is to be attributed not indeed solely but principally to the national system of education but to the men by whom that system was established posterity owes no gratitude they knew not what they were doing they were the unconscious instruments of enlightening the understandings and humanizing the hearts of millions but their own understandings were as dark and their own hearts as obdurate as those of the familiars of the inquisition at lisbon in the very month in which the act for the settling of schools was touched with the sceptre the rulers of the church and state in scotland began to carry on with vigor two persecutions worthy of the tenth century a persecution of witches and a persecution of infidels a crowd of wretches guilty only of being old and miserable were accused of trafficking with the devil the privy council was not ashamed to issue a commission for the trial of twenty-two of these poor creatures the shops of the booksellers of edinburgh were strictly searched for heretical works impious books among which the sages of the presbytery ranked thomas burnett's sacred theory of the earth were strictly suppressed but the destruction of mere paper and sheepskin would not satisfy the bigots their hatred required victims who could feel and was not appeased till they had perpetrated a crime such as never since polluted the island a student of eighteen named thomas Ackenhead, whose habits were studious and whose morals were irreproachable had in the course of his reading met with some of the ordinary arguments against the bible he fancied that he had lighted on a mine of wisdom which had been hidden from the rest of mankind and with a conceit from which half-educated lads of quick parts are seldom free proclaimed his discoveries to four or five of his companions trinity and unity he said was as much a contradiction as a square circle ezra was the author of the pentateuch the apocalypse was an allegorical book about the philosopher's stone moses had learned magic in egypt christianity was a delusion which would not last till the year eighteen hundred for this wild talk of which in all probability he would himself have been ashamed long before he was five-and-twenty he was prosecuted by the lord advocate the lord advocate was that james stuart who had been so often a whig and so often a jacobite that it is difficult to keep an account of his apostasies he was now a whig for the third if not for the fourth time Ackenhead might undoubtedly have been, by the law of Scotland, punished with imprisonment till he should retract his errors and do penance before the congregation of his parish, and every man of sense and humanity would have thought this a sufficient punishment for the prate of a forward boy. But Stuart, as cruel as he was base, called for blood. There was among the Scottish statutes one which made it a capital crime to revile or curse the supreme being or any person of the Trinity nothing that Ackenhead had said could without the most violent straining be brought within the scope of this statute but the lord advocate exerted all his subtlety the poor youth at the bar had no counsel he was altogether unable to do justice to his own cause he was convicted and sentenced to be hanged and buried at the foot of the gallows it was in vain that he with tears abjured his errors and begged piteously for mercy some of those who saw him in his dungeon believed that his recantation was sincere and indeed it is by no means improbable that in him as in many other pretenders to philosophy who imagine that they have completely emancipated themselves from the religion of their childhood the near prospect of death may have produced an entire change of sentiment he petitioned the privy council that if his life could not be spared he might be allowed a short respite to make his peace with the god whom he had offended some of the councillors were for granting this small indulgence others thought that it ought not to be granted unless the ministers of edinburgh would intercede the two parties were evenly balanced and the question was decided against the prisoner by the casting vote of the chancellor the chancellor was a man who has been often mentioned in the course of this history and never mentioned with honour 
he was that sir patrick hume whose disputations and factious temper had brought ruin on the expedition of argyle and had caused not a little annoyance to the government of william in the club which had braved the king and domineered over the parliament there had been no more noisy republican but a title and a place had produced a wonderful conversion. Sir Patrick was now Lord Polworth. He had the custody of the Great Seal of Scotland. He presided in the Privy Council, and thus he had it in his power to do the worst action of his bad life. It remained to be seen how the clergy of Edinburgh would act. That divines should be deaf to the entreaties of a penitent who asks, not for pardon, but for a little more time to receive their instructions and to pray to heaven for the mercy which cannot be extended to him on earth, seems almost incredible. Yet so it was. The ministers demanded, not only for the poor boy's death, but his speedy death, though it should be his eternal death. Even from their pulpits they cried out for cutting him off. It is probable that their real reason for refusing him a respite of a few days was their apprehension that the circumstance of his case might be reported at Kensington, and that the king, who, while reciting the coronation oath, had declared from the throne that he would not be a persecutor, might send down positive orders that the sentence should not be executed. Akenhead was hanged between Edinburgh and Leith. He professed deep repentance, and suffered with the Bible in his hand. The people of Edinburgh, though assuredly not disposed to think lightly of his offence, were moved to compassion by his youth, by his penitence, and by the cruel haste with which he was hurried out of the world. It seems that there was some apprehension of a rescue, for a strong body of fusiliers was under arms to support the civil power. The preachers who were the boy's murderers crowded round him at the gallows, and while he was struggling in the last agony, insulted heaven with prayers more blasphemous than anything he had ever uttered. Woodrow has told no blacker story of Dundee. On the whole, the British islands had not, during ten years, been so free from internal troubles as when William, at the close of April 1697, set out for the continent. The war in the Netherlands was a little, and but a little, less languid than in the preceding year. The French generals opened the campaign by taking the small town of Aeth. They then meditated a far more important quest. They made a sudden push for Brussels, and would probably have succeeded in their design but for the activity of William. He was encamped on ground which lies within sight of the line of Waterloo, when he received, late in the evening, intelligence that the capital of the Netherlands was in danger. He instantly put his forces in motion, marched all night, and, having traversed the field destined to acquire, a hundred and eighteen years later, a terrible renown, and threaded the long defiles of the forest of Soignier, he was at ten in the morning on the spot from which Brussels had been bombarded two years before, and would, if he had been only three hours later, have been bombarded again. Here he surrounded himself with entrenchments which the enemy did not venture to attack. This was the most important military event which, during that summer, took place in the Low Countries. In both camps there was an unwillingness to run any great risk on the eve of a general pacification. Lewis had, early in the spring, for the first time during his long reign, spontaneously offered equitable and honourable conditions to his foes. He had declared himself willing to relinquish the conquests which he had made in the course of the war, to cede Lorraine to its own duke, to give back Luxembourg to Spain, to give back Strasbourg to the empire, and to acknowledge the existing government of England. End of section 9. Recording by Gen Raimundo. Section 10 of Chapter 22 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gen Raimundo. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 22, Section 10. Those who remembered the great woes which his faithless and merciless ambition had brought on Europe might well suspect that his unwanted moderation was not to be ascribed to sentiments of justice or humanity. But, whatever might be his motive for proposing such terms, it was plainly the interest and the duty of the Confederacy to accept them. For there was little hope indeed of wringing from him by war concessions larger than those which he now tendered as the price of peace. The most sanguine of his enemies could hardly expect a long series of campaigns as successful as the campaign of 1695. Yet, in a long series of campaigns, as successful as that of 1695, the Allies would hardly be able to retake all that he now professed himself ready to restore. William, who took, as usual, a clear and statesmanlike view of the whole situation, now gave his voice as decidedly for concluding peace as he had in former years given it for vigorously prosecuting the war, and he was backed by the public opinion both of England and of Holland. 
but unhappily just at the time when the two powers which alone among the members of the coalition had manfully done their duty in the long struggle were beginning to rejoice in the near prospect of repose some of those governments which had never furnished their full contingents which had never been ready in time which had been constantly sending excuses in return for subsidies began to raise difficulties such as seemed likely to make the miseries of europe eternal Spain had, as William in the bitterness of his spirit wrote to Hengius, contributed nothing to the common cause but Rodomontades. She had made no vigorous effort even to defend her own territories against invasion. She would have lost Flanders and Brabant but for the English and Dutch armies. She would have lost Catalonia but for the English and Dutch fleets. The Milanese she had saved not by arms, but by concluding, in spite of the remonstrances of the English and Dutch governments, an ignominious treaty of neutrality she had not a ship of war able to weather a gale she had not a regiment that was not ill-paid and ill-disciplined ragged and famished yet repeatedly within the last two years she had treated both william and the states-general with an impertinence which allowed that she was altogether ignorant of her place among states she now became punctilious demanded from lewis concessions which the events of the war gave her no right to expect and seemed to think it hard that allies whom she was constantly treating with indignity were not willing to lavish their blood and treasure for her during eight years more the conduct of spain is to be attributed merely to arrogance and folly but the unwillingness of the emperor to consent even to the fairest terms of accommodation was the effect of selfish ambition the catholic king was childless he was sickly his life was not worth three years purchase and when he died his dominions would be left to be struggled for by a crowd of competitors both the house of austria and the house of bourbon had claims to that immense heritage it was plainly for the interest of the house of austria that the important day come when it might should find a great european coalition in arms against the house of bourbon the object of the emperor therefore was that the war should continue to be carried on as it had hitherto been carried on at a light charge to him and a heavy charge to england and holland not till just conditions of peace could be obtained but simply till the king of spain should die the ministers of the emperor william wrote to hengis ought to be ashamed of their conduct it is intolerable that a government which is doing everything in its power to make the negotiations fail should contribute nothing to the common defence it is not strange that in such circumstances the work of pacification should have made little progress international law like other law has its chicanery its subtle pleadings its technical forms which may too easily be so employed as to make its substance inefficient those litigants therefore who did not wish the litigation to come to a speedy close had no difficulty in interposing delays there was a long dispute about the place where the conferences should be held the emperor proposed a la chapelle the french objected and proposed the hag then the emperor objected in his turn at last it was arranged that the ministers of the allied power should meet at the hag and that the french plenipotentiaries should take up their abode five miles off at delft to Delft accordingly repaired Harley, a man of distinguished wit and good breeding, sprung from one of the great families of the robe, Cressy, a shrewd, patient, and laborious diplomatist, and Cayer, who, though he was named only third in the credentials, was much better informed than either of his colleagues touching all the points which were likely to be debated. At the Hague were the Earl of Pembroke and Edward Viscount Villiers, who represented England. Prior accompanied them with the rank of secretary at the head of the imperial legation was count Conitz. at the head of the spanish league was don francisco bernardo de quiros the ministers of inferior rank it would be tedious to enumerate Halfway between delft and the hague is a village named ryswick and near it then stood in a rectangular garden which was bounded by straight canals and divided into formal woods flower beds and melon beds a seat of the princes of orange the house seemed to have been built expressly for the accommodation of such a set of diplomatists as were to meet there in the centre was a large hall painted by Honthorst. On the right hand and on the left were wings exactly corresponding to each other. Each wing was accessible by its own bridge, its own gate, and its own avenue. One wing was assigned to the Allies, the other to the French, the hall in the centre to the Mediator. Some preliminary questions of etiquette were, not without difficulty, adjusted, and at length, on the ninth of May, many coaches and six, attended by harbingers, footmen, and pages, approached the mansion by different roads. The Swedish minister alighted at the grand entrance. The procession from the Hag came up the side alley on the right. The procession from Delft came up the side alley on the left. At the first meeting, the full powers of the representatives of the belligerent governments were delivered to the mediator, 
At the second meeting, forty-eight hours later, the mediator performed the ceremony of exchanging these full powers. Then several meetings were spent in settling how many carriages, how many horses, how many lackeys, how many pages each minister should be entitled to bring to Wiswick whether the serving men should carry canes, whether they should wear swords, whether they should have pistols in their holsters, who should take the upper hand in the public walks, and whose carriage should break the way in the streets. It soon appeared that the mediator would have to mediate, not only between the coalition and the French, but also between the different members of the coalition. The imperial ambassadors claimed a right to sit at the head of the table. The Spanish ambassador would not admit this pretension, and tried to thrust himself in between two of them. The imperial ambassadors refused to call the ambassadors of electors and commonwealths by the title of excellency. "'If I am not called excellency,' said the minister of the elector of Brandenburg, "'my master will withdraw his troops from Hungary.' The imperial ambassadors insisted on having a room to themselves in the building, and on having a special place assigned to their carriages in the court. All the other ministers of the Confederacy pronounced this a most unjustifiable demand, and a whole sitting was wasted in this childish dispute. It may be easily supposed that allies who were so punctilious in their dealings with each other were not likely to be very easy in their intercourse with the common enemy. The chief business of Early and Connitz was to watch each other's legs. Neither of them thought it consistent with the dignity of the crown which he served to advance towards the other faster than the other advanced towards him. If, therefore, one of them perceived that he had inadvertently stepped forward too quick, he went back to the door, and the stately minuet began again. The ministers of Lewis drew up a paper in their own language. The German statesmen protested against this innovation, this insult to the dignity of the Holy Roman Empire, this encroachment on the rights of independent nations, and would not know anything about the paper till it had been translated from good French into bad Latin. In the middle of April it was known to everybody at the Hague that Charles the Eleventh, King of Sweden, was dead, and had been succeeded by his son. But it was contrary to etiquette that any of the assembled envoys should appear to be acquainted with this fact till Lilienroth had made a formal announcement. It was not less contrary to etiquette that Lilienroth should make such an announcement till his equipages and his household had been put into mourning, and some weeks elapsed before his coachmakers and tailors had completed their task. At length, on the 12th of June, he came to Ryswick in a carriage lined with black and attended by servants in black liveries, and there, in full Congress, proclaimed that it had pleased God to take to himself the most puissant King Charles the Eleventh. All the ambassadors then condoled with him on the sad and unexpected news, and went home to put off their embroidery and to dress themselves in the garb of sorrow. In such solemn trifling, week after week passed away. No real progress was made. Lilienroth had no wish to accelerate matters. While the Congress lasted, his position was one of great dignity. He would willingly have gone on mediating forever, and he could not go on mediating unless the parties on his right and on his left went on wrangling. In June the hope of peace began to grow faint. Men remembered that the last war had continued to rage year after year while the Congress was sitting at Nimwegen. The mediators had made their entrance into that town in February 1676. The treaty had not been signed till February 1679, yet the negotiation of Nimwegen had not proceeded more slowly than the negotiation of Ryswick. It seemed but too probable that the 18th century would find great armies still confronting each other on the Meuse and the Rhine, industrious populations still ground down by taxation, fertile provinces still lying waste, the ocean still made impassable by corsairs, and the plenipotentiaries still exchanging notes, drawing up protocols, and wrangling about the place where this minister should sit, and the title by which that minister should be called. But William was fully determined to bring this mummery to a speedy close. He would have either peace or war. Either was, in his view, better than this intermediate state which united the disadvantages of both. While the negotiation was pending, there could be no diminution of the burdens which pressed on his people, and yet he could expect no energetic action from his allies. If France was really disposed to conclude a treaty on fair terms, that treaty should be concluded in spite of the imbecility of the Catholic king and in spite of the selfish cunning of the emperor. If France was insecure, the sooner the truth was known, the sooner the farce which was acting at Ryswick was over, the sooner the people of England and Holland, for on them everything depended, were told that they must make up their minds to great exertions and sacrifices, the better. Pembroke and Villiers, though they had now the help of a veteran diplomatist, Sir Joseph Williamson, could do little or nothing to accelerate the proceedings of the Congress. 
for though france had promised that whenever peace should be made she would recognize the prince of orange as king of great britain in ireland she had not yet recognized him his ministers had therefore had no direct intercourse with harley cressy and cayer william with the judgment and decision of a true statesman determined to open a communication with lewis through one of the french marshals who commanded in the netherlands of those marshals villeroy was the highest in rank but villeroy was weak rash haughty irritable such a negotiator was far more likely to embroil matters than to bring them to an amicable settlement boufflers was a man of sense and temper and fortunately he had during the few days which he had passed at hoy after the fall of namur been under the care of portland by whom he had been treated with the greatest courtesy and kindness a friendship had sprung up between the prisoner and his keeper they were both brave soldiers honourable gentlemen trusty servants William justly thought that they were far more likely to come to an understanding than Harley and Connitz, even with the aid of Lilienroth. Portland, indeed, had all the essential qualities of an excellent diplomatist. In England the people were prejudiced against him as a foreigner. His earldom, his garter, his lucrative places, his rapidly growing wealth, excited envy. His dialect was not understood, his manners were not those of the men of fashion who had been formed at Whitehall his abilities were therefore greatly underrated and it was the fashion to call him a blockhead fit only to carry messages but on the continent where he was judged without malevolence he made a very different impression it is a remarkable fact that this man who in the drawing-rooms and coffee-houses of london was described as an awkward stupid hogan mogan such was the phrase at that time was considered at versailles as an eminently polished courtier and an eminently expert negotiator his chief recommendation, however, was his incorruptible integrity. It was certain that the interests which were committed to his care would be as dear to him as his own life, and that every report which he made to his master would be literally exact. Towards the close of June, Portland sent to Boufflers a friendly message, begging for an interview of half an hour. Boufflers instantly set off on an express to Lewis, and received an answer in the shortest time in which it is possible for a courier to ride post to Versailles and back again lewis directed the marshal to comply with portland's request to say as little as possible and to learn as much as possible on the twenty eighth of june according to the old style the meeting took place in the neighbourhood of Halle, a town which lies about ten miles from brussels on the road to mons after the first civilities had been exchanged boufflers and portland dismounted their attendants retired and the two negotiators were left alone in an orchard here they walked up and down during two hours and in that time did much more business than the plenipotentiaries at ryswick were able to dispatch in as many months till this time the french government had entertained a suspicion natural indeed but altogether erroneous that william was bent on protracting the war that he had consented to treat merely because he could not venture to oppose himself to the public opinion of both england and of holland but that he wished the negotiation to be abortive and that the perverse conduct of the house of austria and the difficulties which had arisen at ryswick were to be chiefly ascribed to his machinations that suspicion was now removed compliments cold austere and full of dignity yet respectful were exchanged between the two great princes whose enmity had during a quarter of a century kept europe in constant agitation the negotiation between boufflers and portland proceeded as fast as the necessity of frequent reference to versailles would permit their first five conferences were held in the open air but at their sixth meeting they retired into a small house in which portland had ordered tables pens ink and paper to be placed and here the result of their labours was reduced to writing the really important points which had been an issue were four william had at first demanded two concessions from lewis and lewis had demanded two concessions from william william's first demand was that france should bind herself to give no help or countenance directly or indirectly to any attempt which might be made by james or by james adherents to disturb the existing order of things in england William's second demand was that James should no longer be suffered to reside at a place so dangerously near to England as St. Germain. To the first of these demands, Lewis replied that he was perfectly ready to bind himself by the most solemn engagements not to assist or countenance in any manner any attempt to disturb the existing order of things in England, but that it was inconsistent with his honour that the name of his kinsman and guest should appear in the treaty. To the second demand Lewis replied that he could not refuse his hospitality to an unfortunate king who had taken refuge in his dominions, and that he could not promise even to indicate a wish that James would quit St. Germain. But Boufflers, as if speaking his own thoughts, though doubtless saying nothing but what he knew to be in conformity to his master's wishes, 
hinted that the matter would probably be managed and named avignon as a place where the banished family might reside without giving any umbrage to the english government lewis on the other side demanded first that a general amnesty should be granted the jacobites and secondly that mary of modena should receive her jointure of fifty thousand pounds a year End of section 10. Recording by Jen Raimundo. Section 11 of Chapter 22 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Raimundo. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 22, Section 11. With the first of these demands, William peremptorily refused to comply. He should always be ready, of his own free will, to pardon the offences of men who showed a disposition to live quietly for the future under his government, but he could not consent to make the exercise of his prerogative of mercy a matter of stipulation with any foreign power. The annuity claimed by Mary of Modena he would willingly pay, if he could only be satisfied that it would not be expended in machinations against his throne and his person, in supporting on the coast of Kent another establishment like that of Hunt, or in buying horses and arms for another enterprise like that of Turnham Green. Boufflair had mentioned Avignon. If James and his queen would take up their abode there, no difficulties would be made about the jointure. At length all the questions in dispute were settled. After much discussion, an article was framed by which Lewis pledged his word of honour that he would not favour, in any manner, any attempt to subvert or disturb the existing government of England. William, in return, gave his promise not to countenance any attempt against the government of France. This promise Lewis had not asked, and at first seemed inclined to consider as an affront. His throne, he said, was perfectly secure, his title undisputed. There were in his dominions no non-jurors, no conspirators, and he did not think it consistent with his dignity to enter into a compact which seemed to imply that he was in fear of plots and insurrections such as a dynasty sprung from a revolution might naturally apprehend. On this point, however, he gave way, and it was agreed that the covenant should be strictly reciprocal. William ceased to demand that James should be mentioned by name, and Lewis ceased to demand that an amnesty should be granted to James' adherents. It was determined that nothing should be said in this treaty, either about the place where the banished King of England should reside, or about the jointure of his Queen. But William authorized his plenipotentiaries at the Congress to declare that Mary of Modena should have whatever, on examination, it should appear that she was by law entitled to have. What she was by law entitled to have was a question which it would have puzzled all Westminster Hall to answer. But it was well understood that she would receive, without any contest, the utmost that she could have any pretense for asking as soon as she and her husband should retire to Provence or Italy. Before the end of July, everything was settled, as far as France and England were concerned. Meanwhile, it was known to the ministers assembled at Ryswick that Boufflers and Portland had repeatedly met in Brabant, and that they were negotiating in a most irregular and indecorous manner without credentials, or mediation, or notes, or protocols, without counting each other's steps, and without calling each other excellency. So barbarously ignorant were they of the rudiments of the noble science of diplomacy, that they had very nearly accomplished the work of restoring peace to Christendom while walking up and down an alley under some apple trees. The English and Dutch loudly applauded William's prudence and decision. He had cut the knot which the Congress had only twisted and tangled. He had done in a month what all the formalists and pedants assembled at the Hague would not have done in ten years. Nor were the French plenipotentiaries ill-pleased. It is curious, said Harley, a man of wit and sense, that while the ambassadors are making war, the generals should be making peace. But Spain preserved the same air of arrogant listlessness, and the ministers of the emperor, forgetting apparently that their master had, a few months before, concluded a treaty of neutrality for Italy without consulting William, seemed to think it most extraordinary that William should presume to negotiate without consulting their master. It became daily more evident that the court of Vienna was bent on prolonging the war. On the 10th of July, the French ministers again proposed fair and honourable terms of peace, but added that, if those terms were not accepted by the 21st of August, the most Christian king would not consider himself bound by his offer. William in vain exhorted his allies to be reasonable. The senseless pride of one branch of the House of Austria and the selfish policy of the other were proof to all argument. The 21st of August came and passed. The treaty had not been signed. 
France was at liberty to raise her demands, and she did so, for just at this time news arrived of two great blows which had fallen on Spain, one in the old and one in the new world. A French army, commanded by Vendôme, had taken Barcelona. A French squadron had stolen out of Brest, had eluded the Allied fleets, had crossed the Atlantic, had sacked Carthagena, and had returned to France laden with treasure. The Spanish government passed at once from haughty apathy to abject terror, and was ready to accept any conditions which the conqueror might dictate. The French plenipotentiaries announced to the Congress that their master was determined to keep Strasbourg, and that, unless the terms which he had offered, thus modified, were accepted by the 10th of September, he should hold himself at liberty to insist on further modifications. Never had the temper of William been more severely tried. He was provoked by the perverseness of his allies. He was provoked by the imperious language of the enemy. It was not without a hard struggle and a sharp pang that he made up his mind to consent to what France now proposed. But he felt that it would be utterly impossible, even if it were desirable, to prevail on the House of Commons and on the States General to continue the war for the purpose of wresting from France a single fortress, a fortress in the fate of which neither England nor Holland had any immediate interest, a fortress, too, which had been lost to the Empire solely in consequence of the unreasonable obstinacy of the Imperial Court. He determined to accept the modified terms, and directed his ambassadors at Risbeck to sign on the prescribed day. The ambassadors of Spain and Holland received similar instructions. There was no doubt that the emperor, though he murmured and protested, would soon follow the example of his confederates. That he might have time to make up his mind, it was stipulated that he should be included in the treaty if he notified his adhesion by the 1st of November. Meanwhile, James was moving the mirth and pity of all Europe by his lamentations and menaces. He had in vain insisted on his right to send, as the only true king of England, a minister to the Congress. He had in vain addressed to all the Roman Catholic princes of the Confederacy a memorial in which he adjured them to join with France in a crusade against England for the purpose of restoring him to his inheritance, and of annulling that impious Bill of Rights which excluded members of the true Church from the throne. When he found that this appeal was disregarded, he put forth a solemn protest against the validity of all treaties to which the existing government of England should be a party. He pronounced all the engagements into which his kingdom had entered since the revolution, null and void. He gave notice that he should not, if he should regain his power, think himself bound by any of those engagements. He admitted that he might, by breaking those engagements, bring great calamities both on his own dominions and on all Christendom. But for those calamities he declared that he should not think himself answerable either before God or before man. It seems almost incredible that even a Stuart, and the worst and dullest of the Stuarts, should have thought that the first duty, not merely of his own subjects, but of all mankind, was to support his rights, that Frenchmen, Germans, Italians, Spaniards, were guilty of a crime if they did not shed their blood and lavish their wealth, year after year, in his cause that the interests of the sixty millions of human beings to whom peace would be a blessing were of absolutely no account when compared with the interests of one man. In spite of his protests, the day of peace drew nigh. On the 10th of September, the ambassadors of France, England, Spain, and the United Provinces met at Ryswick. Three treaties were to be signed, and there was a long dispute on the momentous question which should be signed first. It was one in the morning before it was settled that the treaty between France and the States-General should have precedence, and the day was breaking before all the instruments had been executed. Then the plenipotentiaries, with many bows, congratulated each other on having had the honour of contributing to so great a work. A sloop was in waiting for Pryor. He hastened on board, and on the third day, after weathering an equinoctial gale, landed on the coast of Suffolk. Very seldom had there been greater excitement in London than during the month which preceded his arrival. When the west wind kept back the Dutch packets, the anxiety of the people became intense. Every morning hundreds of thousands rose up, hoping to hear that the treaty was signed, and every mail which came in without bringing the good news caused bitter disappointment. The malcontents, indeed, loudly asserted that there would be no peace, and that the negotiation would, even at this late hour, be broken off. One of them had seen a person just arrived from Saint-Germain, another had had the privilege of reading a letter in the handwriting of Her Majesty, and all were confident that Lewis would never acknowledge the usurper. Many of those who held this language were under so strong a delusion that they backed their opinion by large wagers. When the intelligence of the fall of Barcelona arrived, all the trees and taverns were in a ferment with non-juring priests laughing, talking loud, and shaking each other by the hand. 
at length in the afternoon of the thirteenth of september some speculators in the city received by a private channel certain intelligence that the treaty had been signed before dawn on the morning of the eleventh they kept their own secret and hastened to make a profitable use of it but their eagerness to obtain bank stock and the high prices which they offered excited suspicion and there was a general belief that on the next day something important would be announced on the next day prior with the treaty presented himself before the lord's justices at whitehall instantly a flag was hoisted on the abbey another on st martin's church the tower guns proclaimed the glad tidings all the spires and towers from greenwich to chelsea made answer it was not one of the days on which the newspapers ordinarily appeared but extraordinary numbers with headings in large capitals were for the first time cried about the streets the price of bank stock rose fast from eighty four to ninety seven in a few hours triumphal arches began to rise in some places huge bonfires were blazing in others the dutch ambassador informed the states-general that he should try to show his joy by a bonfire worthy of the commonwealth which he represented and he kept his word for no such pyre had ever been seen in london a hundred and forty barrels of pitch roared and blazed before his house in st james square and sent up a flame which made pall mall and piccadilly as bright as at noonday among the jacobites the dismay was great some of those who had betted deep on the constancy of lewis took flight one unfortunate zealot of divine right drowned himself but soon the party again took heart the treaty had been signed but it surely would never be ratified in a short time the ratification came the peace was solemnly proclaimed by the heralds and the most obstinate nonjurors began to despair some divines who had during eight years continued true to james now swore allegiance to william there were probably men who held with sherlock that a settled government though illegitimate in its origin is entitled to the obedience of christians but who had thought that the government of william could not properly be said to be settled while the greatest power in europe not only refused to recognize him but strenuously supported his competitor the fiercer and more determined adherents of the banished family were furious against lewis he had deceived he had betrayed his suppliants it was idle to talk about the misery of his people it was idle to say that he had drained every source of revenue dry and that in all the provinces of his kingdom the peasantry were clothed in rags and were unable to eat their fill even of the coarsest and blackest bread his first duty was that which he owed to the royal family of england the jacobites talked against him and wrote against him as absurdly and almost as scurrilously as they had long talked and written against william one of their libels was so indecent that the lord's justices ordered the author to be arrested and held to bail but the rage and mortification were confined to a very small minority never since the year of the restoration had there been such signs of public gladness in every part of the kingdom where the peace was proclaimed the general sentiment was manifested by banquets pageants loyal health salutes beating of drums blowing of trumpets breaking up of hogsheads at some places the whole population of its own accord repaired to the churches to give thanks at others processions of girls clad all in white and crowned with laurels carried banners inscribed with god bless king william at every county town a long cavalcade of the principal gentlemen from a circle of many miles escorted the mayor to the market cross nor was one holiday enough for the expression of so much joy on the fourth of november the anniversary of the king's birth and on the fifth the anniversary of his landing at torbay the bell ringing the shouting and the illuminations were renewed both in london and all over the country on the day on which he returned to his capital no work was done no shop was opened in the two thousand streets of that immense mart for that day the chief streets had mile after mile been covered with gravel all the companies had provided new banners all the magistrates new robes twelve thousand pounds had been expended in preparing fireworks Great multitudes of people from all the neighboring shires had come up to see the show. Never had the city been in a more loyal or more joyous mood. The evil days were past. The guinea had fallen to twenty-one shillings and sixpence. The banknote had risen to par. The new crowns and half-crowns, broad, heavy, and sharply milled, were ringing on all the counters. After some days of impatient expectation, it was known, on the 14th of November, that His Majesty had landed at Margate late on the fifteenth he reached greenwich and rested in the stately building which under his auspices was turning from a palace into a hospital on the next morning a bright and soft morning eighty coaches and six filled with nobles prelates privy councillors and judges came to swell his train 
in southwark he was met by the lord mayor and the aldermen in all the pomp of office the way through the borough to the bridge was lined by surrey militia the way from the bridge to walbrook by three regiments of the militia of the city all along cheapside on the right hand and on the left the livery were marshalled under the standards of their trades at the east end of st paul's churchyard stood the boys of the school of edward the sixth wearing as they still wear the garb of the sixteenth century round the cathedral down ludgate hill and along fleet street were drawn up three more regiments of londoners from temple bar to whitehall gate the train bands of middlesex and the foot guards were under arms the windows along the whole route were gay with tapestry ribbons and flags but the finest part of the show was the innumerable crowd of spectators all in their sunday clothing and such clothing as only the upper classes of other countries could afford to wear i never william wrote that evening to hengius i never saw such a multitude of well-dressed people nor was the king less struck by the indications of joy and affection with which he was greeted from the beginning to the end of his triumph his coach from the moment when he entered it at greenwich till he alighted from it in the court of whitehall was accompanied by one long huzzah scarcely had he reached his palace when addresses of congratulation from all the great corporations of his kingdom were presented to him it was remarked that the very foremost among those corporations was the university of oxford the eloquent composition in which that learned body extolled the wisdom the courage and the virtue of his majesty was read with cruel vexation by the nonjurors and with exultation by the whigs the rejoicings were not yet over at a council which was held a few hours after the king's public entry the second of december was appointed to be the day of thanksgiving for the peace the chapter of st paul's resolved that on that day their noble cathedral which had been long slowly rising on the ruins of a succession of pagan and christian temples should be opened for public worship william announced his intention of being one of the congregation but it was represented to him that if he persisted in that intention three hundred thousand people would assemble to see him pass and all the parish churches of london would be left empty he therefore attended the service in his own chapel at whitehall and heard burnet preach a sermon somewhat too eulogistic for the place at st paul's the magistrates of the city appeared in all their state compton ascended for the first time a throne rich with the sculpture of gibbons and thence exhorted a numerous and splendid assembly his discourse has not been preserved but its purport may be easily guessed for he preached on that noble psalm i was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the lord he doubtless reminded his hearers that in addition to the debt which was common to them with all englishmen they owed as londoners a peculiar debt of gratitude to the divine goodness which had permitted them to efface the last trace of the ravages of the great fire and to assemble once more for prayer and praise after so many years on that spot consecrated by the devotions of thirty generations throughout london and in every part of the realm even to the remotest parishes of cumberland and cornwall the churches were filled on the morning of that day and the evening was an evening of festivity end of section eleven recording by jen raimundo twelve of chapter twenty two of a history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 22, Section 12. There was indeed reason for joy and thankfulness. England had passed through severe trials and had come forth renewed in health and vigor. Ten years before, it had seemed that both her liberty and her independence were no more. Her liberty she had vindicated by a just and necessary revolution. Her independence she had reconquered by a not less just and necessary war. She had successfully defended the order of things established by the Bill of Rights against the mighty monarchy of France, against the aboriginal population of Ireland, against the avowed hostility of the non-jurors, against the more dangerous hostility of traitors who were ready to take an oath and whom no oath could bind her open enemies had been victorious on many fields of battle her secret enemies had commanded her fleets and armies had been in charge of her arsenals had ministered at her altars had taught at her universities had swarmed in her public offices had sate in her parliament had bowed and fawned in the bedchamber of her king more than once 
it had seemed impossible that anything could avert a restoration which would inevitably have been followed first by proscriptions and confiscations by violation of fundamental laws and the persecution of the established religion and then by a third rising up of the nation against that house which two depositions and two banishments had only made more obstinate in evil to the dangers of war and the dangers of treason had recently been added the dangers of a terrible financial and commercial crisis but all those dangers were over there was peace abroad and at home the kingdom after many years of ignominious vassalage had resumed its ancient place in the first rank of european powers many signs justified the hope that the revolution of sixteen eighty eight would be our last revolution the ancient constitution was adapting itself by a natural a gradual a peaceful development to the wants of a modern society already freedom of conscience and freedom of discussion existed to an extent unknown in any preceding age the currency had been restored public credit had been re-established trade had revived the exchequer was overflowing there was a sense of relief everywhere from the royal exchange to the most secluded hamlets among the mountains of wales and the fens of lincolnshire the ploughmen the shepherds the miners of the northumbrian coal pits the artisans who toiled at the looms of norwich and the anvils of birmingham felt the change without understanding it and the cheerful bustle in every seaport and every market town indicated not obscurely the commencement of a happier age end of section twelve end of chapter twenty two end of volume four recording by richard carpenter in seattle washington